Welcome to Golf Industry Guru and the Gig Podcast, where we interview the best and brightest golf and hospitality leaders on the planet. On today's episode, you will learn some proven real-world solutions that will help you and your team solve some of your biggest golf business challenges. So stick around for some tips, tools, and training to get you, your people, and your business powered on. Here's your host, James Cronk. Well, hello, Gig Nation. It is James Cronk back with another podcast with today from all the way down under Mr. Ben Gibson of the Toolbox team. And we are going to talk about safety. We're going to talk about uh, how to make your club uh, the best place it can be for all of your employees and all of your guests. And I'm thrilled to uh, follow up with another conversation with, with Ben and his group. They do amazing work uh, in the whole sphere of, of what's so important now these days with regards to employee safety, customer safety, and, and having uh, all other tools they actually do as well, you're going to learn about. So uh, it's uh, our podcast today with Mr. Ben Gibson. And Ben, welcome to the Gig Nation podcast. Wow. Thank you, James. What an introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, I know we've had a couple of conversations leading up to this, but it's great to have some really clear time pegged aside to uh, to have a chat and dig a little bit deeper. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate it. I'm humbled by your introduction. Uh, yeah, and hopefully we've got some ideas that we can share uh, and discuss that are of value to your listeners. Um, yeah, and no, as I said earlier, always happy to talk about the uh, the Toolbox team and our amazing crew of uh, within our team and the clients we support. So, yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Well, our pleasure. And we got connected through uh, Jeff and Dave of, of GBAS, and and uh, I started doing some research into, uh, first of all, all the clubs that you service in um, in, in Australia and, and, and down under in New Zealand. And then in you and I chatting, uh, learning more about the fact that you're, you've got some bigger, expansive plans in other parts of, uh, of the globe. So we'll get into that. But um, I guess first, Ben, just to start off and – and tell me about your journey and, and a little bit about uh, where how, how you got to where you are today with your, your wonderful program. Well, um, yeah, look, thank you. And I, I did really think about this. I, I kind of guessed that you might ask me a question along these lines. And um, I'm going to, going to take a moment just to sort of explain how I ended up, I, I guess, really helping golf clubs and, and turf teams with their safety and culture and leadership because – it's funny, I was actually chatting to a friend the other day. I absolutely love our business. You know, the opportunity of what we get to do in an amazing industry is, is such a privilege. Um, but it's funny, no one probably wakes up when they're eight years old and says, when I grow up, I want to be a safety guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite like a pro ball player or a, a fireman or, or whatever it may be. But um, it's funny when you work out, uh, like I think early on in life, I really figured out that I love people, okay? And, and obviously, we've had a couple, couple of conversations and you know, I love, love finding out about people, hearing about their challenges. And, and I think when you can use your skills and experience and expertise to, to reduce the stress of people doing an amazing job, you know, help keep teams safe. Um, so, yeah, look, I'll, I'm going to track right back to high school when um, basically, I, I don't know if you knew what you wanted to do when you're uh, when you're in high school. I certainly didn't. Uh, it was all over the place. And, you know, you, you've got society going, okay, you're going to go to college, you're going to grab a job now. And all I wanted to do was go surfing. Right? So <laughs> I, um, I, I burst out of high school and I actually went into construction for a year and specifically pouring concrete because that was the fastest way for me to earn money to be able to go surfing. And I had... A year's concreting, I remember my dad going, you know, this is a really big decision and, you know, it was probably the fastest introduction I could have had to life because it was a pretty rough industry and a lot of hard work. And then amazingly went surfing around the world but started to think, you know, I might be able to pursue something. Um, I guess const I guess that concreting year probably rattled me a little bit <laughs> about what I was going to look to do for work. So I did come back and, uh, and I enrolled in school and went to college um, and I actually did a management degree. So, uh, and that was really because I knew I wanted to work with people in some, some shape or form. Um, yeah, completed a, a, an undergraduate bachelor's degree in, in business management. And then that led to some roles in, in Sydney and finance companies. And I was building teams and I, I be, sort of ended up becoming a, a bit of a project. If they, they had a project or a piece of software or a new initiative that needed to be rolled out, I'd be pulled in to, to sort of put a crew of people together and manage that team. Really, really enjoyed that and then started to sort of think, well, 
you know, learning more about systems in business. And I actually did some study around environmental science at the time as well, because that's a passion of mine is being outside, whether it's in the mountains or surfing in the ocean. Uh, and then it all sort of, sort of started to take shape. I, I was working with a, a consultancy doing some work in that space, uh, in the environmental space. And it tweaked for me that every business that I met that was really working well, uh, they had a great team, a great culture, you know, they had respect for the leadership. They were really doing safety and compliance really well as well. So I started to do some some of my own personal kind of study and analysis. I did some more study. So I actually did a master's in business leadership, uh, which was an incredible experience. And then all of this, I guess, fundamentally snowballed into a blend of building a great culture and compliance and engagement and buy-in from your team and safety ultimately comes with that. So I think, um, sorry, again, that was a bit of a long-winded no, answer. No, I but, love it. It's fantastic. Look, what that really came came to me and said, look, here's this opportunity, you know, like you've, you've um, you know, all of this goes up. I very rarely say, okay, we're going to stop what we're doing now as a business and we're going to do a day of safety because safety and compliance is something that's threaded into the DNA of a golf club. You know, it's, it's built into those tiny little moments where it could be casual hospitality staff members serving drinks to, to members late at night. It could be, you know, a young turf maintenance staff member backing a machine out of the shed at like 5 a.m., all those tiny little moments. And, yeah, so that's that's really where I guess the Toolbox team has come from with my background in teams and leadership and recognition that great leadership leads to great staff buy-in, great systems, great culture, and great compliance. Does that, that make sense? Well, yeah, well really it totally makes answer, sense. But, I mean, one of the things that I love about what you guys do is that you do speak a great deal about management and leadership and the people aspect of, as opposed to just, you know, here's a template for how to keep something safe. It, it, you know, it also talks about how to follow that up, how to motivate people to be safe, how to be compliant, how to, how to, how to communicate effectively, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to, but here's my question first though, did you see safety and compliance as an opportunity for you to apply that kind of leadership and management skills you had done through school or was, was safety and compliance something that you you have always been passionate about, you know, in, in, and process and things like that. Well, I think um, this is probably going to sound a little bit nerdy. I, I think through my, my early business, I guess, career, like I said, I worked for a finance company, an IT company, and saw some massive like multinational organizations and how they worked. It's actually a bit of a, an obsession with systems. And, and this is getting a little bit personal here, but even in our personal lives, you know, our success is dictated by the systems we have in place, you know, like whether that's, you know, how you manage your own money and your own income or, or what you decide to eat, how you decide to exercise. And, and every great leader that I knew and really respected they, they just had such good systems in place. And that's that's really in terms of delegation as well. And I saw those leaders being able to go on vacation and, and enjoy their, their break. Right. Because they had great assistants or they had great, you know, deputy managers in place sure. and really good systems and structure. And then, yeah, like I said, it all really sort of snowballed for me and, and it turned into that compliance piece because um, – I was exposed to the turf industry through a couple of friends and they sort of started mentioning, you know, and my work actually led into that space. And then there seemed to be a real opportunity to not only bring golf clubs together, as in between the clubhouse and golf operations team and the turf maintenance department, but help to build this really nice club-wide unified approach, which really, I guess, is that blend of great communication, respect between the staff. And look, I mean, Probably from a from a safety perspective specifically, there's two main areas that we want to want to focus on when we jump into a golf club. First and foremost, for me, I know that there's legislation all over the world, you know, that, that governs uh, and laws that govern, you know, what we need to do in terms of our work in a golf club. First and foremost is the behavioural component. Okay, so if we do anything from a safety and compliance perspective, there has to be validity for the staff and the team that it's actually helping keep them safe, because the, the biggest challenge and from all of our time and, and research is, and you may have been there, if, if you've been to a, 
you know, a safety committee meeting and people kind of drag their feet to go to it and no one's really excited to go to a safety meeting, right? So you go in and sit down and no one really knows what to talk about. It's on the agenda. You know, anyone got any suggestions or any concerns? No one really raises anything. And it's pretty limited what may actually come out of it. Whereas the, the backbone of this behavioral safety piece is getting involving your team. So involving your staff, making it really practical and really relevant, because then when you do roll out things like compliance resources, whether it's you know software in an app or you're running a training session or a, a toolbox talk or a meeting, because they've been involved in that process, there's so much more buy-in mm-hmm. and there's validity rather than um, them feeling a little bit like you're just trying to tick a box or cross T's and dot I's. Mm-hmm. Um, Sorry, did I hit our run off again? No, 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 not at all. I think that's uh, you're completely right. And so, so when tell me a bit more about the toolbox team specifically about how long how long has the organization been around and and what what are your services? Like I know that and and give me a little bit of scope about the types of clubs uh, that you're currently working with um, in Australia and, and beyond. Yeah, perfect. Well, uh, as of today, we work with 59 golf clubs across Australia and New Zealand, and we specifically provide resources, support, training, and education around what they need to do from a compliance perspective to not only keep their teams and the environment safe, but also be able to demonstrate to the regulator that if they've got a really robust plan. So they've got evidence of risk assessment and control, evidence of staff training. If they are having an incident or an injury, that they're actually, you know, following up on that incident and injury correctly. So, you know, taking preventative measures, that sort of thing as well. Um, so every one of those clients, they all use our software platform and app. So our resources that we provide them based on their province, their state, you know, their territory, so that specific legislation, we actually feed all that information to them through the app and the platform. So their staff can raise issues via the app. Uh, They can do inspections, you know, uh, document everything from training staff and how do you operate a coffee machine or a piece of equipment in the kitchen, uh, how to set up for a function at a golf club, right through to how to train a a turf department staff member in a fairway mower or a whippersnipper. Sorry, that's probably cultural terminology there, a hedge trimmer. Um, You know, right through to those tools that the the turf department are using as well. So we, we have a bit of a journey that we take clients through in terms of getting that buy in and staff engagement, which is paramount, uh, and using that information and their feedback to then develop those tools and resources and then rolling that out across the club. Mm. So it's look, compliance is one of those journeys um, that never ends. And I don't say that, I don't, I don't want to. Uh, you know, alarm people or cause anxiety by saying that, but continual improvement is the backbone of great compliance. You know, it's got to be threaded into our meetings, threaded into the communication we have with staff. Um, and usually what we find is if we start working with a new client, we, we would do a, a, an audit. So we'd really thoroughly review all of their operations. There's often quite a bit of work to do initially to get them set up. But then we can really, once it's entrenched in their, you know, their meeting schedules and only like bite-sized chunks, 10, 15 minutes, um, and it's communicated out amongst the team, we find it is really, really manageable. Like the, it's, it's not not an excessive load where we have to spend a day a week on on research and doing all this sort of thing. It's, um, it's working in with your existing habits and rituals within your business. That's a really important point from our perspective. We always ask clients, how do they currently meet? Do, are they using software tools like WhatsApp or messenger systems? How can we... How can we harmonize with and capitalize on existing behaviors rather than going in and grind everything to a halt? Stop. You've got Monday mornings at 10 a.m. You've got to have a two-hour safety meeting. It's it's all about, it's, again, just like your personal life, right? It's all about trying to find those ha- those habits mm-hmm. that fit nicely with the, uh, the way you run your business. Ben, um, when you go into a club, you know, <clears throat> There, there are universal commonalities of golf clubs all over the world. You know, there's obviously there's things that are unique and, and there's whether it's language or terminology that's used or whether there's legislation that might be uh, a little bit tweaked in, in, in one country versus another country. But, but fundamentally, it's like, it's like training. It's like good service. It's like leadership. These are principles that apply whether you're in Timbuktu or whether you're, you know, in the, in the city next door. So, um, when you, audit a club or you go into a club that's that's not one of your clients when you're when you're starting from scratch i guess 
Um, what are some of the things that you find that are lacking with regards to so that so that for for one of our our gig nation uh, members or or anyone that's listening to this podcast that operates a golf club that that might not have in their mind a robust safety and compliant kind of program. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, what are some of the things that uh, stand out when you go and, and visit a property? Uh, look, I mean, to, to look at, I guess, the entire property, so turf department, clubhouse, golf operations, and I really say this with respect around the challenge, probably uh, consultation, so communication amongst the staff members uh, around compliance. It is probably that that's I'd say the biggest gap that we would arrive to see, and one of the most valuable aspects. Whether you're talking OSHA, the Centre for OHS, you know, uh, Safe Work Australia down here, uh, it's just the backbone. It does not matter what country, what industry you're in. It's involving your team in safety, and it's that's probably also, funnily enough, the biggest challenge that we really work on in that short piece. And it goes back to that habit and that culture piece I spoke about. Um, I've had regulators well, all over the place explain to me, you know, historically, if you go back 20 or 30 years, all of the responsibility may have been sat purely with the club manager, you know, because they're the, they're the boss, they're, they're, it's entirely their responsibility. But now regulators are saying, I'm going to walk up to the youngest staff member I can find and I'm going to ask them about their interaction with safety, compliance, the environment. So rather than have the manager say, look, I've got this fantastic system that no one in my team knows about right, yeah. and interacts with and uses it, which, um, you know, used to be the cure 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, now it's all about all those touch points and moments where, you know, a young team member in the turf department might, might have had a toolbox talk that morning before they started, you know, uh, or, you know, a safety meeting or a briefing or, you know, there's lots of little pieces of evidence to show this, this fabric and this culture of compliance throughout the business. So, yeah, probably that consultation piece is, is a big one. Um, and without t- sounding too much like the safety guy, uh, emergency management is often a really big piece as well. So having a really coordinated across the club, the turf department, um, we've really got identified patrons in, in terms of fire evacuation. And, and then, look, there's a whole other range of things, but I, I'd, I'd encourage anyone if they really feel like they're starting from scratch uh, and maybe have limited time or limited resources, that, that communication with staff piece and bringing your staff into this journey is, is probably the most valuable way they could begin the, the process and begin the journey. Um, from a regulatory perspective, too, having evidence of that communication is is vital. Now, we we probably speak a little bit of a similar language in our belief in technology assisting the training process. You know, the communication process. You talk about WhatsApp. You talk about uh, your app, for example, the two box yes. application, right? Well, it wasn't that many years ago when you know. A, these things weren't available, or B, uh, they certainly weren't commonplace. And so um, are you finding that with clubs, they're embracing um, bringing technology to communicate, to get to get that message out to their team? Or is that a hurdle to overcome because they, they're – like in our, in our, in our travels um, – communication is often still done on a bulletin board in the staff room. It's absolutely, you know, it's, it's still often uh, maybe done in the beginning of the season with an orientation. And you talk about, you know, you shall be safe and thou shalt not steal. And then that's it. <laughs> Nothing else happens for yeah. eight more months. Good done. luck. You, you know, you start your shift no. tomorrow. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And from traveling all, all across the world to different golf clubs and, this this will sound really funny from a, a business or you know we're we're just finishing the development of our second app okay so that we've currently got our clients in a in our amazing first version uh, we're about to launch our second app but also somebody who still really believes in high quality hard copy resources as well okay so there's a really amazing opportunity using uh, using an app or I'm going to say here and sound like I'm promoting our app and software in terms of what we need to provide from a compliance perspective in terms of reporting, sharing information, incident reporting and identifying hazards, there's some really powerful opportunities. I mean, for example, if a staff member identifies an issue anywhere on the club or out on the golf course, they can snap a photo, answer one or two questions, click submit. Immediately, club manager gets a notification. We can share really vital information like that um, effectively, but then 
the last thing we would want is for a young staff member to get sent a 30-page document electronically to receive it on their phone that says, hey, their club manager is saying, I need you to sign this. There, we know, vast majority of cases, they're flicking to the end of that document, clicking the checkbox uh, and signing off and moving through it. So whilst we, we definitely have that capability in our app, I also said it sounds quite funny, but my obsession is the behavioural piece. We need to make sure that that's still happening with the learning and education from senior team members in the club. So there's still that consultation session and consultation piece happening, but there's a myriad of opportunities from documenting, you know, equipment training, competency training for the turf department. Like I said, doing site inspections. We're using tons of QR coding now around the club too. So staff can scan a QR code to submit an issue. They don't need to navigate their way back to the app and the platform and, um, particularly, too, in the turf department. So our clients have got access to their, their full register of pesticides. Um, so all the data sheets and labels and so much. So, like I said, so many amazing opportunities um, in using that technology. We just need to make sure, and, and really all of our clients, um, the entire crew are on a spectrum of the use of that technology depending on how they operate. Right. Um, and it's dri- driven us, it's kept us on our toes, but fundamentally everything that we deliver you can basically do either digitally or in hard copy, depending on your particular preference. Right, right, right. So, and that's and often and, and, and often age. <laughs> but yeah, well, yeah. And no, no stereotypes there for sure. Because I've made, I, I've been, mm-hmm. I've had that stereotype <clears throat> broken hundreds of times. Yes. Uh, in terms of 50, 60 year old staff, absolutely nailing it, uh, and then having to coach young staff on on how to use different parts of the app in the process. But I think. I go back to communication, consultation, and and real conversations. Conversations in the workplace are what really keep people safe. Yeah, It's that experienced staff member saying, hey, 15 years ago, this happened to me in my career. You might want to think about X when you approach this task. And that's that cultural piece where the youngest staff member in a team feels confident enough because of the culture to go and ask a senior team member and say, look, I know you showed me this last month, but... Could you just show me one more time? I still feel a bit uncomfortable about it. So instead of them going up, go out and give it a go and you yeah. know, man up, if that's the, if that's the way of saying it, they actually go, no, you know what? I've got five minutes. That's fine. I'm going to come and do it. So Dan, really, that probably describes the end game, creating yeah. an environment where people feel comfortable enough to ask. Well, you're completely correct, and and it's you know it's fascinating to me. Um, I, I've, I mean, COVID was a terrible thing. Is a terrible thing. Um, obviously, but what was fascinating about what happened in the golf industry through COVID, in my opinion, was that, uh, well, many things happened, but one of the things that happened when you talked about, you know, golf being a safe uh, exercise and a safe thing to do, and we started having all these policies around, you know, uh, individuals or no rakes in the bunkers or a one person per golf cart or about social distancing. Yes. And, and all of a sudden, I thought that the golf industry had a common purpose and everyone rallied around it. Like, like when, when you had a conversation with your team about, you know, COVID protocols or about this is how we're going to do something, they paid attention and they, and they listened because they knew it was a requirement. You know, it's a sad thing when they say about the fact that it takes a disaster to cause to change in following a policy, right? And, and often what mm-hmm. happens is that, an injury or, or an incident on a, on, a, on a golf course or really in any business will all of a sudden bring safety back up to the top of the priority list. It's like, you know, it was like, well, yeah, it becomes really, it important. becomes really yes. important as soon, you know, once someone loses an eye, it's like, you know, now it's now we're like, where's our safety committee and where's the, let's get the, yeah. let's get the handbook out and get to page 22. So for you, Ben, in, in, in your, with your clients and with other things like that, um, like what are some of those incidents, sadly, that that happen? What are some of the kind of more common incidences that that all of a sudden make a club go, holy smokes, we gotta talk to people about safety more often? Yeah, that's yeah, it's a great question. I'm actually gonna answer a little part of the earlier part of your question there, where at times safety or compliance does fall off the radar and then we, we, we have an injury or an incident and, oh, my goodness, it becomes the, the top of the meeting agenda. And, look, I, I look every golf club that we work with, I see the operational demands on the club manager, you know, maybe the house manager, the, you know, the 
course maintenance superintendent. There's just so many things on their plate. Like I think I actually sat down and worked out at one point, you know, there's hundreds of different activities happening at a golf club on any given day by, by the staff. And, you know, if we don't prepare the golf course for the start of play for the day, things are going to fall over, okay? If we don't have the clubhouse team open and ready to go, things are, things are absolutely going to fall over. So I guess we've got all these operational demands and safety and compliance falls into this basket. Like everybody I know, it's, it's critically important. There's not a leader I know that says the most important thing to me is the safety of my team. Everybody's the same. I feel the same way about my team, but it's not operationally urgent, Okay, so we all know it's really important, but if we have our safety meeting tomorrow instead of today, the world's not going to end. And that's why I really respect how difficult it is to to build a really robust compliance and safety culture because we all know with COVID, we've got hand grenades going off all over the legislation and the updates are changing from the Department of Health and OSHA's sending out information. We're trying to stay on top of that. So, um, yeah, I I guess I'm I'm sort of saying it, it is a really challenging thing for a busy manager and a busy leader to implement. But... Um, look, in all of our time and all, all of the clients that we work with, a golf course and club in any other industry, whether it's US, Canada, Australia, that workplace basically would be closed down for, for the staff, okay? I mean, I don't know how many bunkers uh, are on every different golf course. Could be 30, could be 50, could be 120, right? So we've got these massive potholes throughout our workplace um, we're driving, you know, if it's the turf department, driving equipment and vehicles all over it. If we're around the clubhouse, there's, everyone's driving a little car all around the clubhouse. There's members walking and golfers walking everywhere. And then what we do in, in our work site, we release 200 people out there to fire missiles in, in all different directions. And I know I'm sounding romantic here, but like the, I, I guess the overlap of different activities and risk and, um, it's it's really it's really quite amazing if we think um, you know construction or, or mining or refineries like all those sites are behind six foot fences. You're doing a half a day to a full day of, of safety induction to even actually access the property. Um, yet in, in golf we're we're set free. You know we send staff out there. So yeah, I, I guess um, in a roundabout way, without a doubt, hands down, it's golf ball strike. Yeah, is is the most common and most frequent incident for whether that's turf staff, even clubhouse staff, golf professionals. Uh, there are so many near misses, you know, near misses almost daily uh, with employees around in and around golf clubs and courses. Uh, and then you know, there's there's not a person I know in the golf industry that, that isn't aware a golf ball strike can clearly kill you. Mm-hmm. You know, and I I can ask a team. Uh, I guess if I ask a, a clubhouse team, they've, they've all had near misses. If I ask, ask a turf maintenance department, every hand goes up if I say, have you been hit by a golf ball? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and the stories come out. So that's that's probably the most frequent. Um, I guess in, in terms of severity, uh, from a, a club hospitality perspective, I would say around sort of the kitchen area is a big one. There are lots of hot, hot works going on, uh, sharps. We all know kitchen environments are furiously busy. I don't know if anyone's worked under a passionate chef before, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's a really high pressure, fast paced environment. And unfortunately, that work pace, um, sometimes does also connect with the level of, I guess, safety and compliance as well. And I'm not saying all kitchen teams take dramatic risks, but when it's hot and it's busy and the pressure's on, we, we do tend to cut corners, we rush, we fatigue a little bit. Um, and I, I guess probably the other one really is just vehicle. No, two, yeah, two more, vehicle accidents. Um, so quite often it might be golf carts driving around, around the clubhouses. So we might have... Most golf clubs that we work have have fairly blind corners around the clubhouses. We might have hedges up. Um, you might be receiving deliveries at the loading dock. You know, you've got other contractors arriving and working on site at any point in time. So it's a real, you know, I mean, you, you've been to a thousand busy golf courses on a sunny Saturday morning. There are just vehicles and people moving everywhere in all different directions. Um, and I think uh, without, without sounding uh, obvious, it would be slips, trips, and falls. Uh, would be the other main, if I'm just thinking of, re, you know, reviewing as we get data and we can see feedback from all the incidents that go through our, our client accounts and platforms, there's just so much activity happening that, yeah, people people slipping downstairs in the clubhouse, uh, you know, could be slipping in a bar on a wet floor or wet area, setting up for things like weddings. If, you're, if the golf club does actually big functions on the weekend, they're manual handling lots of tables and chairs. Uh, and out on the golf course, there's 
there's just so many opportunities um, you know, with those equipment and vehicles, you know, driving around bunker edges. It's it's really not uncommon. Again, it's a question if I ask a turf team, has anybody rolled a, a you know, whether it's a fairway mower or a bunker, bunker bike before? Nine out of ten hands immediately go up that they have. They've definitely seen it. Um, and, and again, jumping on and off equipment and, and, and ducking around the turf departments probably, yeah, slip strips and falls would be the other main one. Sorry, another long answer. No, no, Tons. no, no. It's, 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 well, what, you know, what that was, what that was actually a great checklist of the things that we need to be concerned about as operators and managers. You know, I, I've said before many times to people that uh, if you're in this business long enough, you'll see all those things happen. And, and, and everyone has, yeah, and everyone sure. has, right. And, and, and it's really, it's really unfortunately the question of the severity of, 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 of the damage of what those things can do, right? We'll get back to our conversation in a moment. But first, are you ready to learn from the world's greatest golf and hospitality industry leaders? Train your team and grow your business with a membership to Golf Industry Guru. Join for less than $3 per day and give your entire team access to over 150 hours of courses, podcasts, webinars, templates, articles, live Q&A calls, and more. Free content samples and registration details at golfindustryguru.com. So my question, Ben, is you've mentioned the word culture many times. And, and, and you know, when we work with our clients about creating a culture of service or a culture of um, leadership, a culture of a, a great culture for the employees to work in, you know, all those types of things. When we go into mm. a club and assess the culture not from a safety standpoint, but from a culture standpoint. Um, I can tell you what's common is that for me is that, you know, either the leader believes in it or they don't. And if the leader oh, doesn't, 100%, yeah. and if the leader doesn't believe in it, uh, it's, you know, a uh, leopard doesn't change its spots. So, so, yeah. so for you, when you go, I, I would assume that when you go to a club, you know, even if you're working with six different department heads, you know, kitchen, operations, clubhouse, turf, et cetera, um, there's no guarantee that all six of them are going to believe in the culture of safety or or not that they don't, not that they want to be unsafe. You know, it's not like, you know, there's people out yeah, there absolutely. that are intentionally. No one comes to no work. No one comes yeah. to work saying I want things to be risky today. But yeah. But I have worked with lots of leaders, managers that – understand the importance of safety that understand the importance of having a safety meeting, understand the importance of training, understand the importance of saying to someone, don't do something. If you don't feel safe or get a buddy or whatever it might be, understand the need to have employees leave the clubhouse at midnight, two at a two, two at a time and not by themselves. I yeah, mean, the yeah, list goes on and right. on and on. And then I've also had managers that don't think about it and, and it doesn't cross their mind. And, and then when someone cuts a finger that I was like, Oh, darn, you know, that I, I, we should have had more safety. So yeah. how do you, how do you as someone that tries to motivate and engage and, 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 and get leaders to understand the value and the importance of safety? How do you, how do you, how, do, how would you kind of go about doing that? Or, or, or how do you think those things happen? Creating that culture. Yeah, it's a a great question, and then I sort of gave you an indication before. We sound a bit similar if you guys are, a, you know, in terms of assessing that culture in clubs. That's been threaded throughout my entire career, like looking at different businesses. I've worked in a range of industries and, and what great culture looks like, and then we've all seen what the opposite of great culture looks like. And when we initially start or even before we were engaged or really start working with the club formally, um, probably the most important conversation I can have is with the club manager or, or with the, uh, the course maintenance superintendent. Uh, and that's me really, almost on behalf of our team, understanding where they sit culturally in terms of their genuine passion to make this work and their interest in, in driving this system forward and driving safety forward, particularly because, again, it is, and we've experienced this to a certain extent, if someone is really just going, oh, no, we've got to do it, I don't really believe in it, but we have to do it, so we're just ticking a box, that, that's telling our team the types of cues and the additional support and information we're going to need to provide to try and get this through. Um, funnily enough, the, the first stage in, in the process we take a client through is commitment. 
And that, that's really from us as a business in terms of our support network with the club, uh, but also from the senior team of the club. And I'm old enough and, and wrinkled enough, or actually I'm somewhere in the middle, <laughs> <laughs> enough now to, um, to be able to ask those questions quite directly and say, look, we're here, we're all in to support you, but if we've really got a manager that, that genuinely doesn't believe in, in what we're trying to achieve and what we're doing, that's going to make it really difficult for us to help help build a, a culture across the club. So, yeah, so my, my long-winded answer there is really starts start, does start at the top, you know, and then that can even be the golf club board depending on the structure that's been set up. If we've got a board that really believes in, you know, legislative compliance, uh, you know, not breaching different acts and legislation and, and laws that are out there, they're obviously then going to support our club manager. And in turn, the club manager is going to support the team because he has the sort of the support of the board or she is going to support the team. So that that really is going to dictate the level of engagement that we can expect from, I guess, the department heads and then also from the staff. And I find that passion's infectious. I mean, we've all been into a club where there's a, a great club manager and, you know, she's obviously really inspiring the, the people around her. Uh, you know, the other heads of the department, they, they want to host the best functions and run the best restaurant and they want to be the number one club in their town. Um, and there's this real, you know, desire to pursue excellence. And, and they're the organisations where it's, it's just a pleasure and it's, it's really straightforward for us to jump in and go, hey, great culture in place, pretty good communication, lots of respect. This is part of how great teams do things. And, and we find it just sinks in really, really nicely. So, um, yeah, pushing back up to try and build a culture amongst the staff where there isn't that respect and that level of engagement, um, it's, that's really, it does make it a little bit more challenging. But one thing we've found successfully is if we work with an organisation, we actually use a term called safety leader. So not all responsibility and compliance sits on the club manager. So we really work with the club manager to identify those heads of department and we make them the safety leader of their department. So it's almost, almost like an emergency management right. team where you've got, you know, we'll fire wardens or fire department heads. So we, we'll have these conversations at a, at a senior heads of department level and then everybody goes back to their work area to maybe train their five staff or their seven staff or their 15 staff. And so that's how we're really filtering across the entire club footprint. Um, so I, I guess where I'm going then, if, if we have a bit of a, a tough culture in one part of the club, that's no reason the golf course superintendent can't still run a great team, be passionate, look after their patch and report back up into that main system. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I love it. Uh, I always talk, I always complain in, to my Scott, my partner, um, <clears throat> the, you know, business when we're talking about golf industry guru and we're talking about training, we, we always, you know, make the exclamation. I don't understand how they all spend, you know, a million dollars redoing their bunkers, but you know, they don't understand the value of spending a thousand dollars on their employees and on training. When you talk about a, a board or about a, you know, a club, like somehow that, you know, 52 new, you know, improved bunkers is, is all of a sudden going to triple their, their revenue as opposed to uh, making their staff better and more happy and engaged, et cetera, et cetera. And I would think safety is one of those, it's like insurance, you know, I mean, like, it's like, it's the, it's the, the invisible benefit. Right. So, so when you're, when, when you have to have, you, you have to have a safe workplace, uh, but it's one of those things that you only know you need it when something doesn't happen. Right. It's like, it's like, you know, just like you have to have training, but it's in, it's how do you quantify that? How do you measure that? So when you are selling your services to a club or to a GM or to a board that needs to kind of say, Hey, we've got to invest in this. Um, you know, besides the obvious, are, are there some, what, what's, what, what are your, what's your elevator pitch? What's your, what's your speaking points about why a club needs to have the kind of safety program that you provide as opposed to, you know, printing a manual off the internet? Yeah, well, look, it's a funny one. Um, I think in life, I love the fact that in life, you never know where you're going to end up. Right. And, and I think, I've never really, I've never really been in a sales role before. 
Um, and I didn't even sort of really realize that, you know, part of running a business, you know, you're promoting and selling. And next thing you know, you are. You're walking into a club manager's office. You're speaking to a board of directors, you know, and, and you're really sort of pitching. And one thing that I, I love about, um, and I think this is when you realize you might be in the right place, when you, I, I go into a meeting like that, um, I'm really not looking at it like a like a sales meeting, if, if that makes sense. I'm so confident and comfortable. I, I'm, I'm aware of the problems and the challenges that this golf club is facing in terms of compliance. I know the research that they need to be doing, you know, the, the laws, the acts, the legislation they need to be understanding and the time that goes into that. And really all I, I sort of find us doing is I can talk about some of the challenges that they're facing so some of those gaps where we all know that we have to be able to show that we have a safe, safe system of work. It's gone are the days of hoping we don't have an injury and that means we're compliant. We've got to be able to demonstrate it. And I think I just find I, I really comfortably explain that we've got a team of six amazing, dedicated golf and sports turf industry professionals. We're constantly researching the legislation uh, and developing tools to save clubs having to go. And if, if they really want me to quantify it for them, which I've done, if their golf course superintendent has to spend four hours a week researching pesticide acts and legislation and what the EPA wants them to do, um, in contrast to having a third party come in, assess the situation, and then provide it, uh, sometimes that sort of turns into a bit of a, a dollars and cents sort of decision. I know I do that now business all the time. There are some things I'm great at, some things I'm definitely not great at, so I bring in professionals to help me rather than me spend 16 hours, I can have someone spend one hour. Um, so, yeah, look, I mean, the other piece there is most, uh, I think, golf clubs, club managers, uh, and, and particularly course superintendents are aware that there is a range of, you know, restrictions and, and, and legislation and law around the work that they're doing. So I don't think that's new new information for anybody at the moment. And just about every one of those, uh, those, those laws has significant uh, ramifications in terms of penalties, prosecutions, uh, and financial ramifications. Um, sometimes questions around that, you know, around those areas do come up, but really nicely I find just about every one of the clients that, that's approached us about working together, they're really focused on that behavioural piece. They are, they're, they're there because they're interested in keeping their team, giving their team 100% the best opportunity to, to do their work safely and create an environment where they want the club to thrive. Um, it's funny, I think Richard Branson and, and about half a dozen, a dozen other people have been quoted, you know, what's worse than training a team member and having them leave, and that's, you know, not training them and having them stay. Um, and, and that's really, I mean, it's it's an internationally famous cliche for a reason, right? It's 100% true. You know, the, the organisation that isn't investing in their staff and investing in their people is the one that's standing still. And as you know, every industry is rocketing ahead, whether it's with technology, you know, innovation, um, if we're if we're not moving forward, we're definitely definitely sitting on our hands. So, I realise that was a bit of a, a, a long winded kind of explanation, but I think I'm more just go in, explain the requirements, and then really really comfortably explain the research we do, the practical tools we've developed, um, and how that can can fit in and ease their ease their concerns. And, and you know what, if if it's not a good fit. I'm, I'm kind of okay with that as well. If they're really doing really well and they've got it on top of everything, I'll be the first person to give them a high five and go, well done. You know, if you, if you do ever have any questions, please give us a call, but keep, keep going. Well, and, and what's, what's interesting is that it's normally one of two things. It's either um, they, they're doing it and they don't need it, but more likely it's they aren't doing it and they don't get it. You know, it's like they just don't, yeah. they just don't get it. They don't, they don't, they don't understand. It's like what I love about, what you're doing and and to be honest, it's what what I love about what we do as well is that, is that like, I'm not, we're not trying to sell someone a widget. We're, we're, we're selling things that are necessary that are, that are forever. Never. Like you can never do enough training. You can never be safe enough. You can never, uh, you know, motivate your team enough. You can never create a culture. I mean, these things are constant and, and every season it comes a new set of individuals, new set of people, new set of challenges. Uh, it's funny because we actually have that quote on the main page of our website and, and, oh, do you really? yeah, and, that, and the <laughs> other, the other individual that's used that quote, his name is Zig Ziglar, which is a kind of a famous ah, North American yeah, yeah. sales guy. So, um, yeah, that, and you're right. That quote has been used multiple times. Um, so Ben, you, you when a club, uh, and I guess this, this relates whether or not a club uses your systems 
And there's, and obviously there's other companies out there that, that does safety and training and things like that. But, um, on, on your platform, you, you talk about, uh, the online resources that, that clubs get access to. And, and also the, there's the, the, the hands on, I guess, personal touch that, that they can get with you. But what for a club that is once again, kind of, looking at their own library or looking at what they need to kind of maybe touch up on or polish up on. Um, and I, and I love the behavioral piece, but what are some of the most popular kind of, I guess, templates or, or resources that you think that, that obviously clubs are seeking because, you know, they're seeking them more than maybe some other things. So what, 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 what do you find are, 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 are the, I guess the common, uh, principles of, of safety that, that, that a club needs to have in their, in their toolbox, um, you know, literally, but at least they have in their toolbox. Look, um, probably to answer that initially a little bit broadly and simply, any, any legislative or compliance environment anywhere in the world, if we're running a golf club or a business, could be a restaurant, hospitality, whatever it is, there's, there's a really strong expectation if we're inviting staff into the workplace and asking them to interact with all these different components, so whether that's coffee machine, connecting beer kegs, uh, you know, operating turf equipment, machinery, there's a really strong expectation that as an employer, as a business, as a golf club, we've done everything reasonably practicable to prepare that team member to interact with that hazard. Okay, so a you know a casual hospitality staff member in one shift might you know uh, they might connect a beer keg, they might make coffees with a hot coffee machine, they might be grilling sandwiches, making French fries, whatever, whatever. And then at the end of the night, they might get the chemicals out and, and mop the kitchen floor. So that's described a range of critically important training that we need to do for that team member. And that's a really simple way if you're starting from scratch and want to think about, I've only got a short amount of time or a short amount of resource to apply to safety and compliance. If there's an injury or an incident in in the clubhouse or the turf department, say it is uh, staff members on a fairway mower and, and you know, they have an injury, and the absolute first question that the course superintendent and the club manager is going to be asked by the regulator investigating that incident is, how did you prepare that staff member to interact with that hazard in your workplace? And that's where... That's where we, I mean, the opportunities to capture that evidence of training, um, that's just so critical. And I guess to, to connect that to, uh, I guess, the app that we provide clients. So we, we service golf clubs from a whole range of some we go to actually monthly, right through to some just use our software and some of our resources as well, uh, which is what we're providing in New Zealand and actually what we're rolling out in across Canada and North America uh, early in next year. Um, so there's great opportunity in that platform. So you can document that training quite simply. Um, so you can have a conversation with the team member. It'll actually say, give the team member a demonstration now, and then, hey, snap a photo of that staff member using the piece of equipment, and it'll ask you to sign your device, and then ask that staff member to sign your device as well. And we've got this amazing record of that competency training of that team member so that if we do ever have an injury or an incident, we can really simply click on the staff member in the app or click on the piece of equipment in the app and it'll list exactly who's trained and their currency or vice versa. You can click on the employee and it shows every piece of equipment that they've been signed off on in, in our club. So that's, I guess that's an example of not having to write an 80 page safety manual or, or if clubs have a limited budget or, or limited resource availability, that's a really valuable, powerful way of building the base of documenting the training of our staff and doing it really effectively using technology. So you, you're doing the training. It's not all just happening on the phone, but you can document it and, and package it up really nicely. That's brilliant. Did that, that sort of make sense? Yeah, it did. It does. Um, when a regulator shows up, when, when an incident happens and, and someone shows up, what are the, you, you said the one thing that they, they said, you know, like how have you trained that? What, what are their expectations of what you have done. So, so, you know, the okay, answer, the answer could be, well, you know, when they started two years ago, I took them out on this mower and showed them where the brakes are. Uh, I don't have it documented. <laughs> it's not signed. I, it does not. That's a, picture. a tough bit. Yep. Yeah. There's not a picture of them applying the brake, but I did take them out and they were, I can tell you they were scheduled that day and maybe on the shift yeah. it said T on it for training, but what does that regulator want to see 
to keep you out of jail? Well, look, the, the great thing about the, the golf industry, and that's why the Toolbox team exists, absolutely love the industry because it's jammed, packed full of really passionate professionals. I, there aren't many people I meet in the golf industry that don't love what they do. 100%. Love the golf course, love the membership. And that, honestly, that's why I've been drawn in to, you know, to build this business in the industry because I'm hugely passionate as well. Um, and, and look, most of the, you know, most of the clients we start with have lots of great behaviors in place. So like you just described, you know, if that's a course maintenance uh, superintendent, uh, would say, okay, look, when a staff member started, I went out and showed him, uh, you know, and we very few people are going to let people just go out to the workplace and, you know, and cut greens or, or apply pesticide without any sort of introduction. And funnily enough, that describes a, a really significant part of our role. Like what we tend to find, there are lots of good behaviours in place, but like I just described in the app, what are the easiest, most practical, efficient ways to document that journey? So to answer your question, if a regulator is arriving on site following an incident or a pollution event or an injury, there's one big question that they're really using to guide their investigation, and that is, has this site just had an accident or have they actually just had an incident? Okay? And that that distinction is accidents happen. On any given day in any industry, golf industry, Drums are getting dropped, things are getting knocked over, hoses are failing, people are slipping off equipment, you know, and that's, you put humans together, you do lots of busy work, people are going to slip out, you know, there's going to be accidents, but they're, they're looking for a gap in our systems, okay? So from a communication, you know, consultation across the team, training records, regular evidence of those safety meetings or toolbox talks, we're we doing site inspections, are we keeping re- records for our pesticide applications, you know, do we have emergency plans in place? So fundamentally they're coming in to look and really review how systematic your leadership approach is and your management approach is around compliance. And, and unfortunately, if if there are really significant gaps in that strategy and that approach, that's when that light's going off and they're going, ping, this was a lack of due diligence from the leader. There's a gap in their systems here. This staff member hadn't been trained. They're not having regular consultation sessions. Um, and there's really some improvements that need to, need to be made. But, look, I, I find all the regulatory contact we're having um, more and more over the last oh, 20 to 30 years or so, it's a really proactive approach, um, you know, whether that be OSHA or the EPA in any state or, or country. Um, they're, they're forthcoming in, in supporting industries, making sure there's lots of information available, there's webinars, um, you know, I think historically, 30 years ago, you know, everyone was terrified of OSHA and didn't want a site inspection. They're worried they're going to be penalised and fined, whereas I think the regulators, it's fantastic, have really gone, you know what, we're, we're going to achieve a far greater impact. I mean, because their brief is to help workplaces across countries stay, stay safe, right, mm-hmm. not necessarily run around with a big stick and whack everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm really enjoying that because it's it's respecting businesses in different industries and it's going out saying, okay, guys, you're here to maintain a golf course. That involves cutting turf, managing bunkers, you know. So how are you meeting the requirements inside these acts and the laws and the legislation in conjunction with working in this industry as well? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I guess that's to – sorry, I said there'd be a few long No, answers. no, no. Um, to go it. back around to, to, that, uh, to that regulator arriving on site – they're fundamentally coming in to look and see if there's a compliance management system in place. You know, and I can only go by the experience of, of the sites we've been to and the clients we're working with. When when some of our clients have had injuries, because, again, you know, you get groups of 50 people together and send them out to work, unfortunately sometimes people do, um, the, yeah, the resounding response to being able to go, okay, great, here's some of the resources that we've got, you know, around our risk management processes. Let me pull up the dashboard here. So we have a dashboard on the app. Here's some of the recent hazards. Here's we've corrected them. Here's some of the training. We can see our pesticides are in there. We've got our, our safety data sheets and information. All that's really accessible. And, and piece by piece, we can present a really robust compliance management strategy. And what you'll find then is they'll be given an improvement. So just a, hey, can you can you rectify this in 30 days? Or there might be some training. And, uh, but, but we're yet to have a, a client that's actually been given any kind of infringement or penalty uh, because we can demonstrate that, which is which is amazing for the, for the clients. Well, it certainly is. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot um, because I'm going to not talk about the the, 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 the wise clients that use your services or, or, or the clients that use other safety co- company services. But in the industry, 
And, and well, it's, you know what? Let's move that and talk about North America because, because um, my last little question for you is about your expansion in North America. But, and you might not want to answer this question, but if you, in, in your, in your understanding of the golf industry in North America, what percentage of clubs do you think would not be able to answer that question from a regulator that says that they have an effective compliant management system? Oh, that is a good question. Mm-hmm. I know. I just thought uh, about look, it. Compli- <laughs> compliance. Yeah, well done. Uh, compliance is a, uh, is a tricky one because there are so many different moving elements. Of course. Okay. So like we need to train staff members. We might, I mean, if you're in a hospitality clubhouse environment, staff might be seasonal. They could be casual. You know, you, you've got six staff starting on any given week. They all need to be trained. So on any given point on any day at a golf club, it's really difficult to say, great, every aspect of our operations is 100% a hundred percent. But you either do so but you either do, you know, train your team in safety use of a or you don't. Or you yeah, don't yeah. Right? So so yeah. so I'm gonna put you on the spot. What do you what do you think is the percentage of clubs that that would be maybe exposed to not being able to check all the boxes? I think uh I think half of the industry. Yeah. Would be would be in a really big predicament yeah. if they had a significant injury or caused a big pollution incident, mm-hmm. and they'd they'd be there'd be some really significant gaps mm-hmm. in their compliance uh, approach. Probably the next quarter would would be able to twenty five percent would be able to pull elements. It might be something they did a few years ago, or they had a safety manual from a while back. Um, they, they'd probably really be facing some some challenges as well, not to the gravity of the uh, of the first fifty percent. And I guess in that last 25%, um, you know, you're going to have your 5 or 10% that are just absolutely nailing it. Mm-hmm. So they've got everything in place, a really good position. And I've almost lost track of the maths now. No, no, no. <laughs> you're right there. 15, 15 and- or so percent in, in the middle there, which are, they're, they're practically giving it a really good go. Uh, you know, and that's starting to where you get into, I guess, getting into people that we're working with as well. They're operationally really, you know, really doing a great job. They're using bits and pieces of the tools. And one thing I would say to really give respect to, to golf clubs all over the place, there's, there's so, like I said, there are so many operational demands where we're finding regulators are really understanding in that compliance is imperatively important, okay, in having this system and this strategy in place. But if you're able to demonstrate a, a consistent effort and a consistent approach to your compliance management, mm-hmm. if you're scheduled, say you're having fortnightly uh, safety meetings, Okay, and there's something catastrophic that happens in the club, and or whatever it may be, and you miss one. Okay, and then you have one the following fortnight, and you continue on with your your series of meetings. We're really seeing regulators recognise the system mm-hmm. and the habit and the culture, and it really won't be about hey, you've only done 25 of 26 safety meetings this year. It's 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 far more about these guys have a systematic approach, mm-hmm. and that's where. Um, there's a term I used earlier in, in terms of reasonably practicable. Okay, so it's a little bit grey, but we've got golf clubs, and I'll use an Australian example here. Um, we've got amazing golf clubs way out in Western New South Wales. Here in New South Wales, we've got tiny little golf club. You know, we've got one golf course superintendent who has one young staff member running the golf course. We've got a, a club manager that also serves beer at lunchtime in the bar, so he's kind of doing both jobs. Um, but also operating under the same legislation and under the same safety laws as one of our royal clubs, or you know, a, a really huge operation mm-hmm. with thirty people on the on the golf course and fifty in the clubhouse. And there's a reasonably practicable, you know, in terms of the implementation of their compliance management systems. Regulators are looking, and they're, and they're sort of they're taking into consideration things like the club budget and turnover, yeah, um, the number of staff on deck, the resources. And, and I, I'm really passionate about this, and I love the fact that they're taking into account the industry, the business, and then using that to assess that individual club. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So whilst that, that law is there, it's that reasonably practicable implementation, and the expectation is far higher on our large facility mm-hmm. with a big budget um, with full-time administrative team members. Yeah. Um, and did I run way off? No, 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 I got no. You're right there. No, down. no, not at all. It was fantastic. Then. Yeah. So that, that was that was the percentage question, right? But the answer. What, so, what I what I would uh, add to that, what I would add to that, is that 
and I'm sure you're seeing this as well, is I think that number is growing, right? That's improving. So, you know, I think it's like lots of things. But if you looked at a decade ago, I think that there is way more clubs today that have that have got better training, better systems, better compliance, yes. better, better, better that's awareness fantastic. Of, of all those types of things. And I think that the good news is that that's just kind of growing and getting more and more and more. So um, lastly, um, tell tell me about. Tell me about your 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 plans to to come to, to to North America or other parts of the world and to expand your toolbox team uh, app and 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 resources. Well, Lloyd, as we we chatted about a little bit earlier, James, growing starting and growing a small business is one of the most exciting, rewarding, stressful, challenging, amazing <laughs> uh, opportunities you'll ever have. And I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be in a position of having a great team of people, working with a, a huge family of clients that we absolutely love and be really passionate about. And I, I sort of have to pinch myself uh, a little bit whilst I'm still definitely doing 12 to 14 hour days, as I'm sure you're very familiar with and um, I guess in running your own business. But we've just been blown away with the feedback we've had. So we, we built some software about three years ago. So the Toolbox team's coming up on its fourth anniversary. Um, so we've, we've been operating for about three and a half years. And and I guess our, our growth curve, probably like a lot of businesses, has really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's gaining momentum exponentially in terms of, you know, you sort of, you get an idea about leadership, culture, safety and compliance. You sort of put a little bit out there in the in the world and see see what happens and then, yeah, particularly in the last 18 months, we've just had so many great golf clubs jump aboard. I think the industries are watching, and that led to some inquiries over in New Zealand. And then we were really nicely, we were asked to speak at, uh, at Golf Matters, the, the National New Zealand Conference, which happened recently in Christchurch. And that was a great opportunity to share our ideas, and that led, led to some clients over there. And then really nicely, I've got a, a partner lined up um, who's based in California, and, and we are registering an LLC and do actually taking the software and app we're launching now and really specifically researching and refining it for North America and also Canada. Uh, so, yeah, look, we, we sort of – this may sound a bit strange, but we're yet to a point of where we can actually do some proper marketing – We've, we've literally just been responding to incli- client inquiries and referrals. Um, I actually, actually only joined Facebook in 2020. Um, I'm a bit of a bit of a late bloomer, but I had a friend sort of kick me in the in the backside and say, "Look, if you really want to share your message and the great work that your team's doing, you need to get out there." So I've I've given social media a bit of a go over the last 18, 18 to 24 months, and that impact has has really had a made a big difference, and that's globally as well. And it probably contributed to some of the conversations we're having now and a number of the other opportunities that we've had. So we've we've done quite a bit of work, like I said, in New Zealand. And yeah, very keen to. We've had one or two inquiries from North America as well as to whether we're in a position to provide that support. And yeah, really pleasingly, uh, not far off being able to say yes, which is great. Well, we so. look forward to uh, living in Canada. We look forward to having um, access to 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 all that you do in in uh, in North America. And and for those uh, listening that want to learn more. Uh, I, you know, they just go visit the toolbox team, right, Ben? I mean, it's, uh, what's your website? Uh, at the moment, the toolbox team.com.au, but we actually were just launching a new website for specifically for the app, uh, which is the toolbox.tech. Oh, um, so that's the, uh, that's going to be the, the, couldn't get the toolbox. Funnily enough, it was, <laughs> yes, <I'm not> <laughs> uh, it was long ago taken, but, um, but yeah, I think probably the thing I'm, I'm most excited about is I don't know. The golf industry, in in the grand scheme of you know, world commerce, is quite a small industry, and I love the fact that we've been in a position where we've built something specifically for that golf club, golf operations, turf maintenance environment, mm-hmm. and it's uh, yeah, I think that's probably what I'm most excited for. You know, it's not something that's been built for another industry and retrofitted, you know, or tried to convert it and force it onto golf. Um, yeah. Anyway, I think I think well, I, have I used uh, used up our time yet, James? I think we no, have. man. Look, man. It's, uh, the, first of all, there's so many similarities um, and compliments that we have. I mean, the, our, our golf industry guru story is so similar in the sense that you know the niche of the golf market. You know, we're we're only in we're in we're in four, the month 14 or 15th month of our of our kind of growth period. We're not four wow. years yet, you know, but. Um, 
But the fact of, like you said, it's just a wonderful industry. There's wonderful, passionate people. Uh, everyone wants to do better. It is more complicated than rocket science, running a golf club, running a golf course. You got to you got to know how to grow grass yeah. and make a burger and sell and do accounting and, and all, plus all the safety stuff and everything else. So, um, I, I, as I said, I love your tools. I, I've, I've been on your platform. I invite all our listeners to uh, go to your website and to check out. Uh, your platform and for those uh, of our of our of our clients that are in Australia no doubt many of you if not all of you are are part of the toolbox team platform or should be and certainly for those uh, listening um, you know Ben you and I have chatted before about uh, I can't wait to have you on again when your app is launched in North America um, when we can walk through it and talk about some of the resources uh, because it's an incredibly important topic uh, it's an incredibly important, valuable resource that every club needs to have. And I love how you talk about creating a culture um, of safety because uh, because creating culture is what training is all about. So thanks so much for being on the Gig Nation uh, podcast. Uh, and uh, I look forward very much to, to having you again. Uh, so thank you, Ben. No, big thanks to you, James, for uh, for reaching out and getting in contact. I think, um, as we've discussed, there are you know such a great fit in in line with the work that you're doing at Gig. Um, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity. And as I said, I could probably talk underwater. So reach out any time. I'm happy to have another conversation. We'll we'll definitely let you know uh, when we uh, we push out into North America. Uh, yeah, really appreciate it. Great conversation. Thank you, James. Yeah, it was. I will definitely take you up on that offer. Look forward to doing it again. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to this episode of the Gig Podcast. And we will once again see you on the inside. Thanks for listening to the Gig Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and mostly that you learned a few things that will help you improve your business. Join us next time as we continue to bring you the best and brightest golf and hospitality leaders on the planet. Thanks for listening.